Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Exalted is God, the true King. There is no God but He, Lord of the Noble Throne. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, Lord of the mighty throne. Nothing is above him, and he is above all. We have traveled across the vast multiverse of Allah together for a long while now, and yet there is so much that we do not know. Of what we do know, which is the observable universe that we can detect. Within this observable universe, we only know about 5% of what is there, which includes the planets, suns, moons and galaxies. We don't know what the rest of the 95% is at all, which is made of dark matter and dark energy, or as some scientists call, dark gravity. We know 5% of the observable universe, the matter that is within the universe, and we don't even know what the unobservable universe holds. How big this universe is, only Allah knows. For all we know, dark energy is a force that we cannot see in this universe, but maybe it can be seen and observed more accurately from another universe. After all, there are seven universes that we know of. And dark matter? What is dark matter? No one knows. It could be just ordinary matter from another universe seeping into our own. The first heaven. Can you imagine? What if we could detect the energy or the gravity of the throne of Allah? What if scientists are detecting the throne and they don't even know it? What if the throne of Allah is seeping into our universe, which is the lowest heaven out of the seven, and we can feel it, but we can't see it? Wouldn't that be something? After all, the throne is the largest creation of Allah, and the universe is compared to the throne. Well, we are practically nothing. Our Prophet وسلم, said that the seven heavens compared to the Kursi of Allah, the chair of Allah, is like a ring compared to a desert, and the Kursi of Allah compared to the magnificence of the Arsh of Allah, the throne of Allah, is like a ring in a desert. Wait a minute. There's a chair. A Kursi. What is that? Is that the same as a throne? The Arsh of Allah, or is it something else entirely? Let's find out. The Throne of Allah The throne is the first creation of Allah. It is the ultra-massive celestial object where because of its very existence, time began. It was created by Allah, who is timeless. But as the throne was created, so was the cosmic timeline. The pen was created, as was Allah al mahfuz which is the cosmic timeline. So that would all make sense now, wouldn't it? The question of what came first. Some people say it was the pen, others say that it was the throne. But one cannot exist without the other in terms of purpose. It is their purpose that defines them. The throne had to be made first because it is the reference point of ultimate time. It is the beginning of time. And the pen had to be created along with it because the pen is part of the cosmic timeline, which is the mother of the book, Allah al-Mahfuz. So how can we have a cosmic timeline without the time? So how can we have the pen without the throne? We can't. The throne would have had to be created first or at the same moment in time as the pen and with it, the mother of the book. It is said that Allah al-Mahfuz is kept at the throne. It's beginning to make sense now, isn't it? But what exactly is the throne? We surely cannot imagine it. But when we try, its magnificence sends shivers down the spine. And what is this kursi? What is the arsh? It gets a bit confusing, doesn't it? There are over 77,000 words in the Holy Quran. The word arsh, which translates into throne, 
is mentioned 21 times in the Holy Quran. The word kursi, which translates into chair, is only mentioned once. Just once. I bet you won't need three guesses where exactly in the Quran the word kursi is mentioned. Of course, the one and only Ayatul Kursi, the greatest verse in the Quran. The companion of the Prophet wasallam was once asked, what is the greatest verse in the Quran? The companion recited Ayatul Kursi. The Prophet wasallam told him to rejoice in his knowledge. This verse is so important that if you were to recite it before you go to sleep, Allah will send down two angels to protect you throughout the night until you wake. This verse, it is so important that if you were to recite it, the devil would run away immediately. Allah protects you instantly when you recite it. It is so important that if you were to recite it every time after your Fard Salah, as in your obligatory prayer, so five times a day, nothing will stop you from entering paradise except the fact that you are still alive. It is so important that it bears the most beautiful names of Allah, ever living, everlasting. It is the only verse from all of God's books, the Holy Quran, the Gospels, the Torah and all other books that came before it in their original form, it is the only verse that has a structure and a beauty that has never been seen before. Ten sentences, one kursi, one Allah, magnificently worded, mesmerizingly written. These words of Allah are like no other. It takes you away, away, up, into the cosmos. Hypnotic. It is known as the verse of the throne. But hang on, isn't the word throne arsh in Arabic? But the word kursi is used here, which means chair. Most people believe that this kursi, this chair, that is referred to in this great verse is the footstool of Allah. And many don't really know what the kursi is. And others think it's the same as the arsh or the throne of Allah. There are also those who believe that the kursi is the raised plinth where the throne is placed upon as you see most thrones have this, and some even believe that the throne of Allah is the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, himself, which is complete fabrication and should not be contemplated in any way, shape or form. Let's think a little deeper about these theories, shall we? After all, Allah did tell us to ponder over the verses of the Quran, and what better verse to ponder over than Ayatul Kursi? Let's get started. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim God, there is no God but He, living and everlasting. Neither slumber overtakes Him nor sleep. To Him belongs what is in the heavens and what is on earth. Who shall intercede with Him except by His leave? He knows their present affairs and their past, and they do not grasp of His knowledge except what He wills. His throne encompasses the heavens and the earth. Preserving them is no burden to him. He is the exalted, the majestic. Let's have a look at the cosmic checklist. There are six theories about the throne of Allah. Let's rule out one of these theories real quick. The first theory is that the Kursi is the eighth realm or the eighth heaven, and that the Arsh is the ninth realm, or the ninth heaven. That the realm of the Arsh is greater than the realm of the Kursi, and it is not a physical throne at all. It is a realm, like a universe, realm of knowledge and stars. Interesting theory, but let us ask, where is the proof for this? Where is the logic for this theory? Where is the basis? Ever heard about the seven groups of people who will be shaded on the Day of Judgment by the throne of Allah? So they will be shaded by a realm? Or knowledge? This doesn't make any sense. So there will be eight angels carrying a realm of Allah on the Day of Judgment? And now, 
there are four angels carrying a realm again doesn't make any sense and where in the Quran or Sunnah does it mention nine heavens we know there are seven of course there are much more than seven how many universes there are only Allah knows but in relation to the seven heavens as a group only seven universes are mentioned above which is paradise and then you can say you have the realm of the Kursi and Arsh creations which are real so we are happy to cross this theory out the second theory is that the Arsh and Kursi do not exist at all that God does not need a throne Allah is all-powerful he doesn't need rest there are many flaws to this way of thinking let's get one thing straight right away not only does Allah not need his throne he does not need anything or anyone at all so if we were to think that Allah only creates things he needs then let's face it nothing would exist except Allah so this way of thinking is majorly flawed and illogical it's similar to when people ask why does Allah need us to obey him or pray to him again we haven't understood when we ask these questions let us give an example let's say someone has a little toddler and this person tells their child who they love dearly to eat their broccoli I need you to eat your broccoli you have to eat them all they say now does this father really need his child to eat the broccoli or does the child himself need to eat the vegetable because it's good for him the child what would happen if the child doesn't obey the father would it affect the father physically no it would affect the child Allah tells us what to do because we need it for our own good we need him so we pray to Allah because we need him to provide he doesn't need us if we don't pray nothing will happen to him if we don't obey nothing will happen to him if we never existed nothing will happen to Allah the same applies if there were no planets no stars no galaxies no black holes no white holes no low tree no hellfire no paradise no throne no time nothing will happen to Allah nothing he created all these things because he wanted to and he can not because he needs to so applying this way of thinking to rule out the existence of the throne would be incorrect so we will cross this theory out also the third theory is that the Kursi is the raised plinth which the Arsh sits on. The idea is that almost every throne that we see from the past kings and queens had a raised plinth. This plinth usually symbolizes that the king or queen who sits upon this throne is the most high. However, applying this to the Kursi does not seem possible. The raised plinth would have to be bigger than the Arsh and we know from the Prophet ﷺ that the Kursi of Allah is smaller than the Arsh. It is like a ring compared to a desert. So we will just rule this one out. The fourth theory on the list is that the Kursi is the divine knowledge of Allah and the throne is his sovereignty. But then why are there four angels carrying the throne of Allah? And the word Kursi literally means chair. So why is it not a chair? Why is it a metaphor? Just because we can't explain something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. We may not be able to explain it because Allah has not given us that knowledge. And that's okay. That's up to Allah. But again, it doesn't mean that it's a metaphor. It just means that we don't understand it. Yet. And furthermore, people say that since Allah has no shape and doesn't need space, then the throne and the kursi cannot exist. But again, we are diving into how Allah uses the throne, which we cannot do. This question about the how Allah uses the throne is a question we should not be delving into and we won't simply because we can't. Our minds won't be able to comprehend this. We think we know how to imagine things. We think we can imagine the throne. We think we can imagine Allah. Let's try something that seems simple. Just go with me here. Close your eyes. Clear your mind. Imagine a red bicycle. Imagine the blue sky. The turquoise green of the Indian Ocean. 
the orange of a sunset. Now imagine a whole new different color. Go ahead, really give it a try. Try and imagine a color that isn't red, green, blue, orange, yellow, indigo, or violet. You can't, can you? No matter how hard you try, you just can't. It's impossible. The human mind cannot go beyond a certain point in terms of colors. We cannot imagine any color outside the color spectrum of a rainbow. Now we do not know what Allah looks like. And if we can't even imagine a new color, do we really think we will succeed in imagining Allah's throne or Allah himself? It's okay to ponder. We should think as much as we can. That's what Allah wants. We can talk about the throne from the knowledge that Allah has bestowed upon mankind from the Quran and the Ahadith. But we have no knowledge about how Allah uses his throne. So we won't go in that direction. We just know that he uses it somehow and that the throne is related to time and space because of the weight of the throne. It has only been six days for Allah ever since the Big Bang up till now, and the throne is real. So we will rule out that the Kursi and the Arsh is a metaphor also. They are out there somewhere in the cosmos. The fifth and possibly the most popular theory is that the Kursi is the footstool of Allah and the Arsh is the throne of Allah. Let's have a look in more detail, shall we? The word Kursi, as mentioned earlier, translates into chair, so some scholars believe it is like a step before the Arsh, so therefore a footstool, and it is not attached to the Arsh. The Arsh and Kursi are not the same, they are different, they are separate. But here's a question, has the Prophet ﷺ ever mentioned a footstool? Or did he ﷺ just say Kursi and never really explained what that was? Does the word Kursi translate into a footstool at all? No it doesn't, not at all. The Arabic word for footstool is Misned al Qadimin. It comes from the Arabic word for foot, which is Al Qadam, and the Arabic word for stool, which is Al Makad. If Kursi means chair, then that's what the Kursi is a chair. Or why would the Prophet not use the proper word for footstool? Now, some people may think that maybe it's out of respect for Allah, that the Prophet ﷺ maybe didn't want to attribute feet to Allah, because when we say footstool, we think feet automatically. Well, if that is so, why does the Prophet ﷺ talk about Allah's face? How the greatest gift in Jannah is to witness Allah's face, or how Allah has hands? This is inconsistent. The Prophet ﷺ never mentioned a footstool because it is not a footstool. And the most important question, why would the greatest verse of the Quran be about Allah's footstool and not the throne, his greatest creation? Which brings us to our last theory. The theory that the Kursi and the Arsh are the same. Ever thought, why is the Kursi only mentioned once in the Quran and the Arsh is mentioned 21 times? Why did Allah not use the word Arsh instead of Kursi in Ayatul Kursi? Not only is the word Kursi mentioned once, this word is mentioned in the greatest verse of the Quran. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that make us wonder why? Why is something only mentioned once? and surrounded by such beautiful attributes of Allah, ever-living, everlasting, which are said to be the greatest names of Allah. Why would Allah do that? It's a simple answer. The truth always is. Simple. Maybe it's because the Kursi is special to Allah. How Allah is one. He mentions his Kursi once also. And no, this does not mean that the Kursi is eternal. 
The kursi is a creation of Allah. It had a beginning. But there is only one kursi of Allah, because there is only one Allah. That's one reason why the kursi is mentioned only once. Another reason could be that Allah has given us more detail about his throne. Allah has given us a sign that there is more to the throne or the arsh, that a special part of the arsh is the kursi. Think of it this way. A king has a magnificent palace. Inside this palace, the king has a special room, his throne room. This king wrote a book. Inside his book, he mentions his palace a lot, but he only mentions his special throne room just once inside the greatest chapter of his book because it's special to him, because it's the king's room. In this example, the arsh would be the palace and the kursi would be the throne room, a special place. A throne is usually structured in two parts, the smaller chair part and the larger decorative part that surrounds the back of the chair. Now we have zero idea about what Allah's throne looks like, of course. But it would seem that there are indeed two parts, because Allah mentions the word kursi and the word arsh. So maybe the kursi is the chair part, and the larger decorative part of the throne is the arsh? No. Wait a minute. Let's think for a moment. The word arsh means throne. So, if the kursi is indeed the chair part of the throne, the special part, then the arsh, the arsh must be the whole thing. The massive decorative part which is so big that its size is like a vast desert compared to a ring, which is the kursi, so including the kursi, and all of it, all of it, the entirety of it, makes up the arsh, the throne of Allah. But the kursi, the kursi is special. Could it be that the kursi is special because the kursi is what Allah is touching? It is touched by Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, the one and only. There is none like him. Even though the kursi is much, much, much smaller than the arsh, it has a distinct value that the arsh may not have. The arsh has a different value in terms of size. It is larger, yes. The kursi is like a ring compared to the desert, which is the arsh. But a question comes to mind. A desert is more magnificent indeed. But isn't a ring like a precious treasure found in that vast desert? Just a thought. After all, Allah does love it when we ponder. How is the kursi touched by Allah? We do not know. We cannot imagine this and nor will we try, just like we cannot imagine a new color. We just know that the kursi is special and Allah is using it. Somehow, the kursi is a special part of the arsh, and so it is part of the throne. The arsh and the kursi are indeed one. Check. Allah is above his arsh in a way that befits his majesty. Allah is using his kursi. We don't know how, Allah knows best. Only Allah knows exactly what the arsh and kursi are. We can only put our minds together and see the evidence and come up with the best theory we can. But it is becoming more clear that the kursi and the arsh both make up the throne of Allah. Why? It's that question again. Why would the greatest verse of the Quran not be about the throne of Allah? Come on, it's obvious, isn't it? The greatest verse would be about God's mightiest creation. Inside this great verse, Allah says, He knows their present affairs and their past. So he's talking about the timeline of everyone here and it's interesting that the preserved tablet is kept at the throne of Allah, which we know is the cosmic timeline and has all the knowledge of the universes. Allah says, and they do not grasp of his knowledge except what he wills. His knowledge of everything. And then Allah talks about his special chair, the kursi and by extension the entire throne. 
how his throne encompasses the universes. Allah's throne is his first creation, and it is what's shaping ultimate and absolute time. So it's only fitting that the greatest verse of the greatest book is about the greatest creation. Not only is the throne Allah's greatest creation in terms of size, it is also the greatest in terms of weight. The throne is so heavy that it is bending space-time in a way that no other celestial body is. So much so that it has only been six days up there inside the realm of the throne. Our Prophet wasallam, knew that the weight of the throne was something special when he advised his wife to make a supplication that would be equivalent to a whole morning of praise. He told her to say, Allah is free from imperfection and I begin with his praise as many times as the number of his creatures in accordance with his good pleasure equal to the weight of his throne and equal to the ink that may be used in recording the words. Every time a supplication has the word throne in it, or we invoke Allah as the Lord of the throne, Allah protects us from evil or harm or even sadness because when we call out to Allah as Lord of the throne, we are basically saying that we understand that Allah is the one true King, the Almighty, and that only He can ward off evil and harm. Wherever the throne is mentioned in the Quran, it is either surrounded by the subject of time, like the six days, or the sun and the moon, or the word throne is linked to the one who owns it, Al-Malik, the King. Allah emphasizes over and over that the throne belongs to Him and Him alone. He is the only true King. There are four angels carrying the throne. And on the day of judgment, there will be eight angels bearing the weight of Allah's throne. Allah is above his throne in a way we cannot contemplate. It is only with his permission alone that these angels can carry his throne. You see, these angels don't have the power to carry the throne. Allah gives them that power. They were only able to carry it after saying, La hawla wa la quata illa billah. There is no power nor strength except by Allah. Only after declaring this true fact, Allah allowed these angels to carry the throne. How exactly? We do not know. What we imagine can elude us, because we do not know all physics. We barely know the physics of our own universe, let alone the physics inside the realm of the throne. For example, we say the Kursi is below the Arsh. But what is below in a dimension with different physics? The Arsh is above. What is above in a dimension where the physics is different from what we know? Imagine a world where everything is upside down, inside out, black is white, white is black, different colours, different forms, different shapes, and still we wouldn't come close to what's up there. What is up there? Keep looking. Keep searching. Never stop until you uncover the secrets. Never stop until you reach him, the Lord, the majestic Lord of the mighty, throne of Allah. It has been said that, at the death of a beloved companion of the Prophet Sa'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, at the moment of his death, the mighty throne of Allah shook, because it has been said that when a martyr dies, his soul is transformed into a green bird. What kind of bird? We don't know. But it's definitely not what we think, that's for sure. Then this bird rests at the throne of Allah, where there are hanging chandeliers, we say chandelier, but who knows what they are, really? Maybe they are stars. After all, Allah does call the stars of the first heaven lanterns. I wonder what Allah calls the stars inside the realm of the throne, and what those stars look like. After all, what is a lantern compared to a chandelier? So the mighty throne of Allah shook because it was overjoyed. That makes one wonder that there is a hidden question, a whispering secret, that the throne of Allah is 
alive.